Hello and welcome to yet another special episode of the Gestalten Podcast. My name is Martin Groschwald and I am extremely happy to welcome a a person that I've known for quite some time now who I uh, had, you know, multiple times the pleasure to actually meet and had long conversations with and I I'm very happy that he joins us on the podcast, which is the absolutely lovely Sam Livingston from uh, our friends at Car Design Research. Welcome, Sam. Thanks, Martin. Nice to be here. Thanks for uh, for joining us. And uh, uh, for everybody who does not know you, you're actually you know quite well known. I would say um, your you know your little company uh, is not that little anymore. You're doing quite a lot of stuff with Car Design Research. Uh, from what I know. And I think from what is uh, what is visible online as well, uh, you're not the traditional kind of design agency that does uh, sketching for the car companies or product design companies or you know pretty much anybody who's interested in the creative area. Um, you are much more in in the areas of uh, research of. Uh, actual consulting, uh, connecting creativity or the design department with other departments in, in, in these organizations, such as marketing, you know, the sales department for them to understand what's happening in there. And uh, you have, you have done some great projects in the past. You've worked a lot with Volvo, um, if that is, uh, of course, correct, which then turned into the Polestar brand. You've done some stuff with Ford. You've done some stuff with Renault. Um, so you, you've come around a little bit, and I hope I uh, I didn't miss a, a beat over here. Um, but feel free to add a little bit onto that um, to give the, our listeners a, a small little overview on what you usually do on your day-to-day level when you're not talking to me. <laughs> no, well, thanks, then, Martin. I mean, I think we struggle also to describe what we do sometimes um we're not uh um the 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 square peg in a world full of square holes um and as you say we're not a a normal design agency we're not really a design agency at all i suppose we don't deliver uh design material or design work to our clients but nonetheless we do almost exclusively work for the design groups of car companies our clients are the design directors for the brands you've mentioned we've done a lot also with um, many japanese chinese korean brands and, and some in america too so um we work very closely with quite a lot of the car brands um and it's on the design side and as you said what we are doing is a bit different we we do work which sits potentially or sorry it sits actually uh, between the market and design um, brand and the future in as much as we connect the design activities to the other Mm. areas Um, so a lot of the work we do is research that sort of uh, comes up with um, uh, useful uh, food for the design process Um, we work closely with design directors to help them develop their future strategic visions for their uh, uh, design groups. And of course, that has to connect to the rest of the business. That has to connect to the brand. Um, It has to be distinct to competitors. It has to understand where future markets uh, are going. So yeah, the work that we do, Martin, is not actually design, but it is for the design groups of these car companies that that we all know. But you still obviously have to be creative in the approach of working with these guys. I mean, uh, one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you about is the topic we talk about a little bit later, which is mobility, but also, of course, the growing importance of research. Um, you know, with we had a couple of conversations on the podcast that were about user experience. They were about customer experience. We talked about, you know, things such as virtual reality that grows more and more into, into the creative spaces, but also beyond of that. So in your day to day activity, when you, you know, when you work with all these customers that you have, and you were talking about research, uh, I think the normal kind of, let's say, listener, student, uh, you know, people who don't necessarily know how the car industry works, or even people that do know how the car design industry even works, would say, well, you know, we don't ne- necessarily do internally a lot of research. We think we do research or we do like, you know, check the internet a little bit. Um, but from your kind of perspective, where where do you see these car companies um, maybe lack a little bit of research talent or qualities or how, how do they not approach it in a way that it will help them so that you as a company or, you know, with your team, of course, um, really give them that kind of extra, um, you know, that, that, yeah, that kind of extra to to develop something because that's you know it sounds always like the the, the research part is is part of the day to day activity, but from my experience, it's not really. Yeah, well, 
I think that last thing you said, um, I would totally share that sentiment. It's not really part of the, the normal practice of most of the design groups of car companies. Um, and I'm smiling here, Martin, um, because I'm familiar with talking with you and you managed to cover a huge <laughs> range of uh, spaces there. Um, so exactly how I respond accurately, I'm not totally sure. But um, I think I share the sentiment that I, I think I can hear in, in what you're saying. Um Creatively, uh, uh, creativity and research are not two words which are normal cousins. Um, I think most designers find the word research uh, not particularly sexy. And if I'm honest, I don't either. Mm. Um, and I don't think research where you're just uh, Googling something, where you are just asking a customer what sort of thing they want, that's not interesting to me. And I don't think it's very useful to car designers. The work that we do, um, and we really pride ourselves on this because the whole team here is from the design or the creative side. We're not market researchers mm. in our background. The work that, that excites us and that we think is useful to our clients is stuff which is useful uh, to clients. And that's about um, sto creating stories for the future, understanding what something could be. For sure, giving it some robust context, connecting it back to uh, potential markets or, or profitability uh, or opportunities which are tangible uh, and making the, the, the sort of intuitive, uh, creative leap that clients have to make a little bit more uh, robust, make the, this jump off point that they're um, jumping from a little bit more solid. That's a lot of our job. But so too is this creative side, as you've alluded, as you've alluded mm. to. Um, it's important in the work that we do that we are conceiving what future intent there is. I don't believe somebody can just sketch a pretty picture and then believe that that's uh, and then that that's legitimately uh, going to be a solution for the future. It's it's too much of a random shot in the dark. I think that the best uh, future concepts, the best designs that we've ever seen will have a lot of artistic intuition. Mm. Designers have a, an inherent ability to understand the future, even if they can't articulate it. But nonetheless, if they are able to uh, use those skills and competencies, um, but have have a basis from which to step from with that, to have a clear brief and intent and understanding of focus, a direction, a strategy, mm. um, and indeed potentially bits of research to substantiate that, they're going to be far more likely to hit the sweet spot, far more likely to have a successful product, mm. and essentially also more likely to have a project which wins inside their company. Uh, I mean, the work that we do doesn't just inform what designers might be doing for their design strategy, for their corporate uh, intent for the brand, as the work we've done for Kia and Hyundai and uh, other brands, Volvo, you mm. mentioned. Um, but sometimes it's about a very specific product or an element within that product. Uh, but, but also it's just giving the correct background and context for designers to be more informed um, to, to, to make their decisions from. And then in turn, to use that to substantiate their directions. A lot of the success of the work that we have done for our clients has been for that client to take the material uh, and to use it mm. effectively to get other stakeholders in the business to understand the reason the business reason, uh, the way in which this design intent could be more profitable, be more successful with the brand. Um, and, and that is also an important part of, of why research is useful in this creative realm. How What I find interesting about this is, so you're working with creative people that live in a somehow controlled chaos. The chaos obviously delivers um, you know, the creativity for them, like the new ideas, the innovation. But at the same time, you know, your... Uh, your data, if you want to say so, also supposed to work for different other departments that are maybe not working in this creative environment or like, you know, in this, uh, in the wrong way, put uh, chaos, such as maybe a marketing or a sales department. So is, is that the biggest kind of challenge that you usually have is to kind of combine these together? Because I could think, you know, you're delivering or, you know, you're working with the creative departments. You try to be a little bit logical, I guess, logical as possible um, to show them like, you know, this is the reasoning of why we make our uh, you know assumptions. And um, I, I could very well imagine that a lot of the creative staff might struggle a little bit with that. They're just like, yeah, but it's just my gut feeling. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm understanding your question. But there's two sides to it that I understand from you, Martin, which is that if there's a gap between, if you like, the chaotic, chaotic, chaotic creative mm. side of design and the more um, methodological or uh, factually based practices of marketing, how might we sit between those two elements? Um, and it is a challenge. I mean, fundamentally, whilst we might do work which informs or, or comes up 
uh, against marketing or brand within the car mm-hmm. companies. We work predominantly for the design groups. So they may use what we have. Uh, we may be uh, working with them to provide uh, material which is valuable to them as they interact with their other groups there. Um, but fundamentally, we don't, if you like, have to uh, uh, be so concerned um, with how what we do interacts with marketing. We're very much there uh, to su- support design activities, the creative activities. And surely there's, there's parallels that can be drawn with what we do relative to marketing groups. But in my view, and perhaps this is a, an unfair thing to say, the work of marketing groups normally provides not so very much valuable uh, uh, intent or direction or substantiation for the, the creative endeavours of the design groups. As a whole, uh, design is an island. Um, and in a way, that's a great place to be. Um, but what we can sometimes do is give that island a little bit more firepower um, to give them a sort of an objective external perspective on alternative uh, intents and directions, but also give them something which helps them leverage their creative uh, leaps mm-hmm. uh, in a way where maybe some of their colleagues in marketing, in brand, in sales, uh, in product planning m- might perhaps uh, get a bit more buy-in. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, yeah. yeah. Um- I want to, I want to, I want to, you know, kind of push the conversation into something that you guys are doing as well. But I think for me personally, uh, is one of the the major things uh, that's going to happen in the future. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the idea of what is the future of mobility. And I want to give you a little bit of a thesis that I that I personally have. I spoke about this in our last recording of uh, of the regular podcast. And I personally think that you know, moving forward, we will have just a handful or like, you know, very few manufacturers that will produce, let's call them the platforms for what we call transportation or like, you know, vehicle transportation. This could be for cars, commercial vehicles, could be for lorries, trucks, those kind of things. Um, But I certainly believe we will have much, much more, you know, brand value coming from that. So, you know, you and me, we could start a, a car company, hire a few people, and then we buy pretty much the platform from someone like Volkswagen um, from that side. So before we jump onto the mobility side, from from your perspective, from your experience, um, do you support this kind of thesis? And what is really nowadays from the from from what you can see the the value of brand compared to just simply the product? Um, and broadly, Martin, I, I support what you're saying. And I think what you're talking about really is the sort of divorcing of the, of the, the tangible hardware uh, from the, from, from the branded uh, stuff that people buy. And, um, I mean, it, it's something which has been progressively happening for a while. But I, I think we can see, um, not least with car share and with other fractional uh, means of accessing some form of personal transportation and potentially the migration of that away from personal transportation towards shared. I mean, at the moment, the, the distinction between a, a bus and a car is quite marked. Um, as soon as we have some form of autonomous transportation, so in certain circumstances, I don't think they're going to be all pervasive. Uh, you could argue there's going to be uh, new genres of, of somewhere between personal mm. and public transportation, which don't exist uh, at all uh, and are perhaps barely in the minds of, of the majority of people at the moment. But uh, just disregarding that, the, the, the transition that you're talking about, the direction, I, I think that there's legitimacy to that. It's obviously um, not an easy path to read how that will uh, uh, develop and go forwards um, in the short and medium term. Um, but there's an attractive, ob- obviously, there's an attractive set of possibilities within that. The idea that one might actually be able to realize more design variety, mm. uh, more different flavors of vehicular proposition as a consequence of having other brand types involved, having uh, more disparate designs, certainly on the surface, uh, if not underneath in the hardware form. So um, I, I do think there's a, a great viability there. And, and I believe it will mostly come off the back of um, other brands being engaged on the more uh, fractional use on the car share, but also on different corporate uses of products. Um, if you think about a hotel chain and the way in which fundamentally they need a vehicle to take mm. people from an airport to that hotel, the nature of that person, the nature of their usage and their expectations is so divorced from that of the, the normal car, if you like. Um, so the ability to uh, be able to offer more bespoke 
uh, customer facing, user facing uh, vehicle typologies, which as you've alluded to, may share a lot of hardware with other products in a way which is invisible to the user. I think that's a tremendously uh, exciting and, and realistic future possibility. Clearly at the moment, we're not quite there. Um, how will that breaking point happen? I, I confess I'm not wholly mm. sure, but I think it's a very exciting potential future. Do you think that the car manufacturers are ready for that future? It's um, uh, The short answer, I suppose, is no. Um, I mean, it's interesting in my experience, the way that the predom predominantly our client base is those of automotive OEMs with whom we are familiar mm. with as automotive OEMs. But we have done and do do projects with those with brands which sit outside of being known to be automotive brands ones which may yet come to the fore um, i have to be <laughs> careful to uh, not speak out of turn um, and there is still clearly a, a huge um, void a huge gap that exists there um, we're yet to see the like of a Samsung car, for example, and I don't think it's likely that such a thing would appear in the short or medium term, just as I don't think a Nike or a Virgin uh, car might do either. But um, the route through which that might happen is, is an interesting one. And if and when it does happen, just as in a way Tesla, as the sort of strongest startup of the noughties, really shook things up um, I think that the emergence of a non-automotive brand, if they hit a, hit a few sweet spots, will have a huge effect and the incumbent brands will clearly have to change. At the moment, obviously, they're, they're going through a lot of pain uh, with regards to electrification legislation that's forcing that through, uh, the cost implications mm. thereof, uh, a squeeze in market from the China and so on. And in an environment where you are essentially a very um, uh, heavy organization with a, a lot of investment uh, and relatively low profitability and if you like quite a lot of uh, legacy um, culture and systems in place the ability to pivot and to truly step beyond uh, the model that they've been investing in forever i think that's obviously something which is a big ask and i can't see much evidence of many of the brands doing it i think in a way though martin just to follow that question um, to some extent that the slight disappointment for myself which is that the, the startups in china have not embraced yes. it and seen it because you could argue that they have every opportunity to do just that and yet they do seem to be playing the old game and not the new game i mean it's it, we, we've had this conversation a little bit off the record as well um you know multiple times i mean when i personally look into china they have everything you know in this in this culture like in the cities that could make these kind of new ways and new ideas and new opportunities actually work i mean look into didi uh, is a, a for me a, a perfectly good example um you have ucar you have all these different kind of new companies jumping into the car industry but i think um if if you want to jump into this kind of industry and you know the car industry for me is the big one um because nobody, you know, we, we see this a little bit with e, uh, VTOL, so the fly tech, the flying taxis now. That uh, there's other startups that want to go into these kind of new mobility ways, um, but in general, all of them are pretty much only want to be car manufacturers. Uh, there is not a lot of service coming out of them. Uh, the same counts, by the way, for the uh, for the VTOL guys. I mean, you know. It's first and foremost an engineering way of thinking about some things like, oh, it needs to drive, it needs to be safe, but it's not thinking about the services. And I think we're still very, very far away from connecting th these two things together because the car industry itself, and that doesn't, you know, that's not just for China, even though there are all the startups in there, um, they're just they're just old in their way of thinking and I don't really blame them. I mean, you know, they've done this, you know, for parts over a hundred years and it has worked for them for a hundred years. Yeah. So why, why would you change right away uh, just because there's a new kind of direction, but with all this new technology coming in and also with this new generation that has an always on mode pretty much with their phones, the idea of communicating with each other, getting somewhere has just completely changed. And I, 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 I don't want to say I, I, I worry about it, but we clearly can see this with Dyson, you know, getting out of the car industry in that sense and just like developing technology and BMW actually saying the opposite. It's like, look, we don't want to be a service provider. We want to be the Airbus of the car industry. You can, you can see that there's a start of diversification 
that comes with that. And it's going to be really interesting to see who jumps onto which side and who will survive by the choices that they will make. And I, I would actually predict that um, we would probably lose a third or even half of the, uh, the, the, the or original manufacturers uh, to these uh, to these decisions that they will have to make because you know fifty uh, percent will make the right decision and the other ones will make the wrong decision. Yeah, I, I expect a lot of what you're describing uh, will come to fruition. I mean, it all sounds quite bleak, <laughs> Martin, and 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 of course, there's a you know that's maybe the way that it is. But I still think there's a lot of opportunity ahead in in China and and actually in a way to bring in another facet to our conversation that you've not alluded to. Um, in China, not only have you got um, a lot of potentially uh, uh, financial support for a new organization. You've potentially got legislative mm-hmm. support, which is unprecedented, the ability to to uh, almost t- flick switches uh, to get the uh, infrastructure to come on board with a more modern way of doing things. Um, but I think the other thing that people don't talk about very much is that in China, you have a f- huge market with less legacy and mm-hmm. expectations than you do in any of the mature Western markets. Um, I'm sure they know what, car, what a car is and they know what a good car is and a bad car is. But I believe that they are also much more likely, the Chinese um, customer, to be able to embrace a new way of doing things. Um, And at the moment, my uh, frustration when I see the the myriad of often very strong new Chinese cars is that they still ultimately conform to a Western idiom as to what a car is when I believe there is clear opportunity for the Chinese product, which is a car, as well as the service that you're talking about, to go beyond that um, and to properly usurp the sort of 20th century understanding of what car is um, and deliver something which makes more sense mm-hmm. in China and can indeed could be indeed exported from there. That, that it's a country which has the potency to do this, the opportunity to do this, and I would suggest also uh, the, the hungry customer which could make it happen. They just perhaps don't yet have that creative solution in place. 100% agree, and uh, I think it comes down to the point, I mean, you know, um, I'm not quite sure if you still are a tutor at the RCA, but you definitely have been one in the past. Um, do you do you see this is going to change? I mean, you know, if we look into the big universities, especially the creative universities, design universities, RCA, Art Center, you know, from the car perspective, Pforzheim, Umea, there's more and more Chinese students um, being part of these courses. Is that is that the first kind of step to change this long term, so that they will start thinking about, you know creativity and design in their own way and not just thinking it in a, in a in a western way i don't know if it's the first step master but it's obviously an important one yeah i'm still at the royal college of art um, i've tutored there for some time now um, and i was there this week and indeed this week i was having tutorials with uh, some great students um several of whom were from china um and yeah surely um not all students not all chinese car designers will necessarily have the future vision but i I know that many um uh, many of them will have and have got the competence to do this i don't believe it's um that simple though i think that whilst there is still an opportunity for chinese student and chinese um, in the industry designers to to show a future intent i think the challenge is organizationally that many of these chinese companies are uh, expecting very very mm. quick wins and they are perhaps run by people with less um, intent on bettering the world and on creating a new and different way of doing something they are perhaps more driven by uh, shareholder value um, by uh kudos from their peers and so forth so actually the the motivation to break the mold um, which perhaps we see more from uh, classically from american culture is not quite so embedded uh, within china and clearly they're also in a realm which they're still new and quite young to so being you know masters of the automotive industry before you can move on from the automotive industry is perhaps one thing mm. that they don't have but yeah i, I don't know martin that's a long-winded way of answering that i think it's perhaps more to do with the organizations the chinese car companies as they stand um, and the principles within there uh, as opposed to the actual yeah. designers themselves yeah. um I want to I want to use the opportunity to talk about China uh, and combine it with mobility and with with the general kind of idea of mobility um because every time I'm in Shanghai you know 
I'm I'm just astonished by how easy it is nowadays to get around. You have the super cheap option, which is the public transportation. You have the cheap option, which is the taxis or the DDs. You know, you have chauffeur services that are a little bit more expensive. It, it's just incredible. It's like you know, if anybody would come up to me and like, I have no idea where to go and you know how to get from A to B in China, you're definitely doing something wrong. Um, how? How is China for us an example, just in terms of the the you know the opportunities that we can see mobility is moving towards to? So, um, I think just to give a little bit of an example, with Didi, you know that kind of revolutionized and alongside Uber, of course, as well. Uh, you can't forget them. You know how to get from A to B in a car. We will see, or we're seeing already now with companies such as eHang, with uh, Volocopter, with uh, Lilium, that this is also something that they want to push for in the future with, uh, you know, with these uh, vertical takeover landing machines. And then, of course, we have the autonomous driving in that sense. So we have all these new different kind of ideas about mobility. Um, where are we going with this? I mean, this is, you know, obviously at some point we have to find a way, which is the preferred one. I'm still personally not 100% sure about autonomy per se, because I think it's going to be, you know, very locally based in that sense. But how, how do you see from, from, from the work that you're doing at the moment that the people approach these new ideas about mobility and, and, uh, is, is it just about a car anymore? Is it, is it, is it much more than just that? Um, yeah, I love your questions, Martin, because I, I can always choose which ones to go for. I mean, I, I can hear and I know, and we've had these conversations, as you've said before, um, that you have uh, quite a, uh, and rightfully so, quite a, an excitement about uh, China and the energy there and the way in which they're leading in so many respects. Um, and I don't contradict that. But I suppose that the illustrations that I would hold up don't all come from there. Um, a lot of the Chinese developments, I think, are, are sort of infrastructurally based. Um, and uh, I see sort of less evidence of the more nuanced or uh, sort of softer or emotive ingredients that excite me about advancements in mobility. And I guess that, that's me uh, trying to suggest that there's other directions. We just ha had the Tokyo Motor Show. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, you think of products which we are now seeing coming from Japan, uh, the Toyota APM, um, this advanced people mo mover, which they've developed just for the Tokyo Olympics and the Paralympic mm -hmm. Games, um, the Yamaha and Sony collaboration, the SC1, that you've got these essentially small electric shuttle bus pod car vehicles coming through. And yeah, they, they sit in a small niche. Um, but just seeing how the Japanese are doing that, I find really exciting. And, and sure, we're not all going to look to Japan for all developments and future mobility. And China is a big thing. And, and so, of course, is many of the European territories in America too. Um, but I'm mentioning those because at the moment, those are quite front of mind for me for being uh, evidence of an exciting thing which is happening. The, the uh, first steps we're seeing really in terms of um, the, the public being potentially able to travel in vehicles with greater autonomy or indeed fully autonomous qualities in some instances. Um, because they are, if you like, niches that sit in captive routes uh, that travel at low speed. The, the, the autonomous space is something that the wider public still uh, perceive to be just around the corner. But we're still talking a lot about it in the media. There's a lot of money that's going into it. But mm. I struggle to see how it's going to have much impact in terms of the normal vehicles that we are familiar with beyond low speed application. But when we look at dedicated autonomous vehicles, surely there is an opportunity to see those coming through with low speed devices, which could be wholly new vehicle typologies offering wholly new solutions, uh, which could then disrupt the markets that sit around them. They could disrupt cars. They could disrupt buses and taxis. This could be the, the groundswell that we're looking at. So I suppose, Martin, those are the ones which interest me at the minute in terms of new sort of approaches to mobility uh, that I think are exciting from a vehicle design perspective. Hmm. So taking this idea a little bit further, um, and I think Tokyo is a great example for that as well. So let's say, you know, you have these little pods, um, very dedicated for a certain kind of purpose. Um, do you think, and this, this is, this is now obviously, <laughs> I think this, this will take it on to the next level. Um, do you think that the transportation designers or the designers of these products, vehicles, um, also need to evolve into city planners? eventually because if you have autonomous driving um i've spoken to somebody who who works on the the programming of all these 
you know, of all these algorithms for autonomous driving. And uh, that person mentioned to me, one of the toughest thing is obviously to predict a mixed traffic. So a traffic with autonomous vehicles and non-autonomous vehicles, even if you have sensors in, uh, you know, cars or like vehicles that are already driven, um, you there's always a certain kind of risk that the driver will do something that cannot be necessarily predicted in the best possible way. So do you think that in one hand, when you design one of these pods, you actually have to kind of, and even if it's like, you know, just v virtually design the city as well to, to make this product work? Yeah, it's an interesting perspective. I mean, in a way, uh, if you think of history of automotive products, the design of cars, it's been a very singular thing. You design in the, in the first instance that they were coach built. So it was literally one off designs and they were designed for the ownership of literally one uh, wealthy man normally, of course. And as you're postulating in the future, that's going to be very different. It's already quite different now. Um, and so to actually be able to conceive of this singular product in, in, in the context of being many many of them around so to see how that would literally a, a, a work visually and work in other forms as a collective potentially as a swarm is an important thing the extent to which that thinking then needs to migrate into the understanding of the technical parameters that sort of underpin the movement and the uh, uh, provision of the service i'm not sure and maybe you're not alluding to that but it does conceptually open things up quite differently as a whole vehicle design is about designing an object there's the clay model mm. let's scrape it there's the digital model let's 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 sweat it let's make it really the finest artifact um and there's not perhaps so much consideration for how that might be in in a crowded environment or or indeed how it might be uh, when presented in multiple form and i do think that that's a, a very viable point of view to be making but actually in a way martin what i think you're also alluding to is how much of the classical competencies of a vehicle designer uh, shall be relevant in the future Correct. what might be those other new things which come through um and you know i love my cars um i i got a, a taste for the older classics um i've got a massive appreciation for the craft and competencies of today's car designers arguably the finest industrial artisan craft that the world has period you know the amount of energy effort and um, artisan uh, skill that goes into the industrialized product which is a car today is just unprecedented and exceptional um, and one has to take the hats off to these designers and indeed the modelers that conceive and craft such fine fine forms but arguably that will become potentially anyway i think of less import and some of the the stuff that sits within the screen that sits within the service proposition that sits within the vehicle's aesthetic when seen from a very far away perhaps in multiple form will become more important you know the, the ability to think more like an architect more like a uh, an ux designer as well as just the the, the uh, artisan crafter of the amazing thing which is a car will become more important and i and i think you know that's that's a very true thing that's an interesting point because you know we we're obviously talking and you've probably heard this hundreds and hundreds of times we're talking about a lot of digital tools are being used nowadays to develop cars or like to develop vehicles so you know it's almost like the the companies want to eradicate the physical models and you just mentioned the first thing you know was the clay model um so with with these ideas moving forward, and you've mentioned this, you know, like quick wins, uh, especially for the Chinese companies. Um, do you think that this kind of new kind of range from mobility will actually bring back a little bit more of the, let's say, old more old school ways of doing things with just this, this in, entire craftsmanship, with this, which is the the quality of a clay model of an understanding a surface to enhance the brand or and or the product again, because it seems a little bit just like you know we're we're going we're going further and further with the technology with like you know the communication or the connection the connected car and all these kind of things. But to really make a difference is we're going back into uh, you know how how we've learned that the most beautiful cars arguably um, were made and that it was by hand. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think that's an obvious uh, future direction. I, I think it'd be lovely to think that it might be a, a component of that, Martin. Um, I suspect there's still yet many car brands that will continue to to push the urgency and cost effectiveness of digital development mm -hmm. over and above those of manual development. Um, but it would be a strange world to think that uh, the sort of uh, t t time worn artisan skill 
of resolving surface form volumes and so forth of a of a of a, of a hard artifact which is a car will, will just disappear um I, I don't believe they will go and as, as i think you're alluding to maybe they could in some instances come to the fore clearly within the premium space it would seem um, odd to think that they would um die out there's a component of this also which is about the if you like the storification mm. of uh, how a car is made if you think particularly in the premium space the way in which um now and certainly into the future the it, there is opportunity for the person subscribing and buying and using the car to be aware of how it was conceived there's a lovely story to think that actually you've all you've literally got an artist really um using clay to conceive of this industrial artifact that that doesn't happen in other spheres um so to be able to if you like hold that up more as a story uh, and brands do it a little bit we're aware of it in the car design community but it doesn't go very far were there opportunity for that to be better known one would suppose that the process of conceiving these things um and this artisan process mm. of, of 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 realizing the design um, might might become more famous and therefore might become more baked into the, the sort of way in which they're communicated and i suppose it also plays to some of the thinking that you're expressing earlier on in this conversation about uh, how maybe the, the technical platforms are more consistent and and, and invisible and, and and provided by uh, fewer suppliers whilst the, the top hat the surface that the core design artifact that we see is more variable and um uh, more numerous in, in, in their number from different brands. If we see that variety, then the ability for hand crafted, um, more resolved, more refined designs to come through as opposed to quickly developed ones or on a tight budget that use digital tools, maybe that will come through. Uh, maybe that will be a point of differentiation. I mean, you know, if we, if we look back into the more like industrial design uh, side, then of course, if you look into Apple, that, you know, Apple was a company that has put a lot of, you know, a lot of interest pretty much on the design, not just internally, but externally as well. I remember, you know, the, the, the presentations with Steve Jobs and there was always the Johnny Ive video in there as well, where he was talking and, you know, they, they, they became memes nowadays pretty much for the, uh, for the current, uh, for the current generation. But I think if we use this a little bit as an example, um, where you say like, look, technically everybody has the same platform or the same the same chips. They can they can go towards the the, the manufacturers um, where the design plays an important role. And I think Apple. I mean, I remember my and I've, I think I've mentioned this before. Uh, my mom, she was just like, oh, this is a beautiful device, you know. And I remember she never necessarily said this about the car, but she said it about a phone, um, even though the inside of the phone had not really that much difference to a, a Samsung or something like that. So I think, you know, maybe the car industry is a little bit behind that, but, you know, they're trying to push this, but um, the, 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 the design becomes almost like the, the, the only big differentiator for everybody to see right away. And I think, you know, the, the car company should be a bit more, uh, let's say, you know, interested in pushing the design side rather than just leaving, you know, letting the, the, the marketing guys push for whatever they think is the right thing. Yeah, for sure. And, and at the moment, we're mostly talking about the sort of surface and form and yeah. aesthetic. Um, and obviously, it does go beyond that into behavior. We look at how the ID3 um, is taking some baby steps, but some great baby steps towards, uh, as, as Volkswagen purport, that it is an empathetic a car or an empathetic car brand and whether you buy into that or not as you said you know this is a sort of marketing push they are trying to deliver that in some respects about how the car's ux behaves inside and indeed outside the car um, and it's not just about the, the 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 visual appearance of the thing it's how the lighting is working how the lighting is animated the sounds that the car makes the the the, the cleverness with which it does things and the way it behaves as these things as these vehicles become more sophisticated and sure that's not maybe uh, uh front of mind for all designers but fundamentally it is in my view still a sort of design side responsibility because we're looking we are or have been the custodians of the emotive relationship that the uh, car has with its user um, and to extend that beyond just the form 
um, and the geometry and into the relationship through its behavior, mm. I think is a really exciting prospect. And I, and I hope that goes through and that then plays out to the directions that you're yeah. talking about. It is much more human centric. Yeah. Do you think that's the main or the, or the biggest issue that car, car or transportation design has at the moment, that it can't necessarily make the connection to the digital world and the experience behind it, that it's still fundamentally about haptic? I think that's a, one of the big one, Martins. And I, and I suppose I'm answering this knowing that, that, <laughs> that we've got a similar view because we've spoken on this yeah. before. Um, there, there is this disconnect, and I think it's an organizational one. You've got um, design directors with exceeding amounts of abilities who've come through the ranks predominantly because they're great at designing the, the geometry that the hard surface and the form which remains massively important as core of course but uh from kind of nowhere is coming also a different set of competencies which feels like they're kind of they're going into a void i don't believe that most car companies have um sufficient um uh internal positions uh, of some standing that have responsibility for the way a vehicle mm. behaves. Um, it sits somewhere uncomfortably between engineering and design, but I don't believe it really wholly sits in any of them. And, and of course, it falls into some of the supplier's laps. So there's no uh, cohesive story. And that's why, essentially, your mum's holding up the phone and telling you, Martin, how much she likes it, isn't it? It's because she, there isn't a car that does that. Uh, exactly. And it's also something I think that... Um, um, I, I don't want to mean this in a bad way or something like that, but, you know, because... The complexity that you've mentioned earlier, and the you know, the, just the, the the amount of work that goes into a car, takes such a long time. Is that you know, by the time you develop one, which could be easily five years from the first sketch until it hits the street, there could be an entirely new generation that sees things differently. So I think there's a um, an inherent lack of knowledge happening within the studios of the generations within the studios that cannot be. Uh, implemented into car design as quickly as maybe we think it should happen. But, uh, you know, this is part of the process and this is changing now, of course. We're seeing, you know, shorter and shorter design process, shorter production processes, you know, cars being released two years after the first sketch and all these kind of things. So these, these timelines are getting smaller and smaller. But it doesn't necessarily change the fact that I think top level management loses touch a little bit with the younger generation to understand what these new interaction methods are. And uh, that creates then silos in the companies. And I think breaking up these silos is a, is a massively difficult thing because of, you know, the thinking of power. I mean, you know, if you're the leader of a creative organization, you in the end have to make the decision which kind of, you know, design you're going with. And, uh, you know, allowing yourself to accept other opinions and maybe to to make a decision that you don't agree with but with just a better uh, decision uh is is already extremely difficult and then these new technologies come in um and you know you don't necessarily understand them but you have to make decisions on them so that 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 is a problem i see at the moment so maybe you know even organizations have to change to adapt to these changes to to really you know bring this idea of a customer experience brand experience user experience you know all those things together into one to 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 really make it um like a phone for example where then you know my mum would say hey I, i love this car yeah exactly and i mean we, we we both are aware as well that you know we i think we we have conversations with a similar um people in the industry and that there's not many any design directors that, 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 that give you an impression they've got any spare time mm. whatsoever. These are guys who are working harder than they've ever had to work before in their life. So to come along and then say, hey, you, you know what, there's a whole load of stuff that you need to think about more. That's that's never going to be something that can be easily accommodated. Um, but for sure, yeah, there's this other avenue, whether it's called UX or HMI, uh, if it's about the relationship that the car has, its behavior, um, the whole package, but fundamentally a different and new set of ingredients that it didn't have before, that they are important. And I do hope that more design groups are able to better embrace um, what they are and how they could really take things on further. And I think that's a nice way to uh, to end the conversation because that's in the end our job as well to help them to you know to open up a little bit and and have these new ideas and like you know listen to these new ideas and and what happens around them. But before I let you go, Sam, uh, I usually have three three questions to everybody who's on these special episodes. So um, I'm actually going to start off with the easiest one, I think it's always. Um, who would be a designer 
that you either have done a project with or would love to do a project with uh, that you would probably admire the most? I'm kicking myself for being aware of these three questions and for failing to have uh, thought. Um, and that's a tremendously hard uh, question to answer. Um, I've known, I've been fortunate enough to know Peter Stevens for, for, for a very long time um, from before his days, even at Lotus. Um, and uh, I realized that I've not really ever worked on a program with Peter. We've, we've collaborated on things. Um, he's worked uh, with us on different things. Um, but my awareness of some of the exciting, um, diverse range of programs and projects he's involved in um, and, and his amazing ability to to be a, a great designer, but a, a lovely person to work with too, makes me think that actually, yeah, it would be Peter. It'd be great to think there would be a, an avenue one day to, to do something with him. Lovely. Number two, um, which, and we, we, we limit this to cars, yeah, I think to make this a little bit easier, which car project of any given period would you have loved to be part of? Um, I'm lucky enough to be sitting in the office at the moment looking at a, a looking at a Citroen DS that's parked outside. It's not actually mine, um, but it's a very fine looking thing, um, and it's a car that I've I've loved for a very long time as an artifact for what it is, as a piece of sculpture sitting on the driveway at the minute. But I guess the reason I'm answering your question now with the Citroen DS is not just because I can see it; it's because I know how massively potent mm. that was in its day there's a car from 1955 that still looks a bit like a spaceship and the impact that it had and the degree to which it went beyond the realms of any expectation to have been involved in a program like that would have been fantastic but also to be involved in a program kind of with old school car companies which were really trying to conceive something which was better that was more advanced that way we were pushing themselves they were not designing that vehicle to fit a market to conform to some understanding of a customer they were doing what they thought was the best solution uh, for, for transport for people and the, the sort of whole ethos that sits within that and the way they resolved it. Yeah, that would be the, the, the car that I'd love to be involved with. Last but not least, if you would have any money available, no limit whatsoever, what car would you buy? I worry that this comes back with Peter again, um, but it would be a McLaren F1 and it's not because he designed it. It's because it remains for me such a pinnacle um, and it's perhaps also a bit like the DS in as much as the reason I would want it is because it's so purist. It's such a plain sheet of paper. You know, why would you have three seats? Because it makes sense to do so. So many facets of that design fundamentally make sense in a sort of rationalist design perspective. But then, you know, it's obviously uh, goes pretty well. And, um, you know, it, it's got a sort of level of awesomeness about so many facets of its design, which are not just functionalist, which are about the emotive side. So, uh, yeah, without even pausing for breath, I'd have a McLaren F1, please, Martin. Lovely. Thank you very much for joining us today, Sam. I really do appreciate you taking the time. Uh, for all our li listeners, Sam, if they want to find you on social media, what's the, the best way? Is Twitter still the best one or LinkedIn or what's the best way? Um, it's, it would probably be LinkedIn for me. Twitter sits a little bit more abundant uh, as I've found that I lose time to it and don't gain much value from it. So yeah, we're, we're, I'm on LinkedIn um, and obviously Car Design Research has its um, own fairly findable um, website cool. as well, I think. So go guys, check it out. Um, it's pretty cool. If you want to get in touch with Sam, he's extremely approachable um, for all of these. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Obviously, you will hear back from us very soon because the Tokyo Motor Show review is going to come up as soon as Eric is back from his well-deserved holiday. And in the meantime, enjoy listening to other podcasts enjoy listening to this podcast to all the episodes and if you have any inquiries you know where to find us on social media thank you guys <laughs>